For the better part of a decade gone, James Polygon Window, Caustic Window, Aphex Twin has unreleased music under several thousand monikers great pace. In 2014, a press release appeared in my inbox. It announced the return of a musician who had helped define the electronic sound of the 1990s, but then all but vanished from view for 13 years. It was exciting because it heralded the return of Richard D. James, also known as Aphex Twin. And Nicarana Cornwallow, England grows, James as a young maniton and started DJing. The email is a little glimpse into the mind of one of popular music's most important electronic producers. Selected flamboyant works moving to London. The language used, a mixture of nonsense speak and Cornish dialect reveals an artist who is drawn to a very personal kind of storytelling. And so begins the myth of Aphex Twin. Well, one of the best ways to become an object of obsession is to have some sense of mystery. And there was definitely a lot of mystery about him. I heard he has got a tank. Yeah. He created these stories. I've heard he has a submarine. From the story of making these fragile instruments when I first spoke to him in 92. You know, legendary things he was supposed to have done. He bought a bank. All of that created a kind of mystery. Very quickly, it becomes difficult to distinguish the way you're perceiving the music to the way you think about him as a person. And if there's mystery there, it really, really appeals to a certain kind of fan. They begin to think that someone is speaking to them exclusively. It's a very powerful thing. I love Aphex. I love Aphex Twin. I love you, Richard. It's Aphex Twin, Richard D. James. Just how much really good music has he made that he's just not telling anyone about? Okay, so let's put this in. I wouldn't say I'm an Aphex Twin obsessive because I only have 56 records and CDs by him in my collection. And I can understand why people are willing to pay thousands of pounds for the rarest of his records, travel halfway around the world to catch a glimpse of him playing a DJ set, and why a new Aphex Twin album is considered a music industry event. Which is all the more remarkable, seeing that this is what his music sounds like. I've been a writer for 22 years and I've interviewed most of the living musicians that I really want to meet, but I've never managed to talk to Richard D. James. Once, someone I know, who is kind of mates with him, took pity on me, emailed him and said, Look, this guy really likes your music and I think he kind of gets what you do. You should give him an interview. And apparently, he just sent a smiley face back by fax. The thing about Richard D. James is the closer we get to this industrious but shy musician, the more he slips away, treating our attention with a mixture of irritation, gleeful mischief and willful elusiveness. I think I heard of Aphex Twin in the early 90s. I read about Analog Bubble Bath, the first record he released. And then I was either asked or suggested that I interview him in 1992. Oh yeah, do you think you can find us back? I've got no change, so... Alright, I'll call you back now. Right. Okay. David Toop, the experimental musician, music writer and academic. At that time he was at Kingston Polytechnic. He was young, he was very polite and immediately interesting. I mean, that's the most important thing, just trying to do something that hasn't been done before. He was talking about the way he was making music. Just yeah. something fresh to listen to. Just circuits that he couldn't actually transport to a gig. You know, if I took it out at the moment, it'd just all bust up because it's yeah. pretty delicate. Then the second time was in 1994. That was when the myth of Aphex Twin really came into being. It was his suggestion to meet outside a supermarket in Angel Islington. 
And I was very happy with that because, you know, I was pretty bored with the normal press office type interview. And he said, you know, we'll go and do some shopping and talk. And then he didn't show up. So I was standing there in the rain for half an hour. And I was irritated, yes, of course, I was irritated. Probably had a bruised ego. But then there was half of me also that really admired that. Why do everything by the book? In a way, it was the first sign of a new anonymity. He had an obtuse way of dealing with things which felt like somebody, you know, who was from somewhere like Cornwall and had grown up away from everything and done everything their own way. If you listen to one of his records, so there's some influence from breakbeat music and ambient music and Detroit techno. They're all sort of in there. He caught something of the idealism of that moment. Yeah, there was something new going on. a feature about him for a magazine called The Face. Well, that in itself tells you the problem that was coming. These people, the, what he called the bedroom bores, they couldn't even stand to work with a recording engineer, let alone glossy photographs made of themselves. They wanted to do things on their own terms, and he had a record coming out on warp at that time. And I imagine that they said to him, look, you've got to do this. So a couple of days later, he dutifully showed up. Yeah, like I was always making noises and, and I didn't sort of know what I was doing until my parents got a piano just full of woodworm and it sounded really weird. Just remember the first day I got it, banged up and down it for about 10 minutes. It started taking it apart around the back. I just ended up facing the keys to the wall. From that point onwards, they never bothered saying anything about anything ever again, I don't think. I had that for years, and I used to love playing little strings and stuff on it. Have different objects wedged under each string, and had the weird scales. I don't think I ever had a normal scale. And then we talked about some of the things that have really become part of what he's famous for. It's just like, I've been able to do it since I was little, and it's my most precious thing. He talked at length about lucid dreaming. I've done everything that you can do, talking and shagging. And I often throw myself off cliffs and uh, skyscrapers and zoom off right at the last minute. It's quite good fun. But then, about a year and a half ago, I just thought, I badly want to dream tracks. Like, imagine I'm in the studio, write a track in my sleep, wake up and then write it in the real world. I mean, maybe he was telling the absolute gospel truth, but... I... <laughs> I'm really not sure about that. I tend to be pretty skeptical. That's the most powerful thing of all, when you feel you really know somebody. But there's an unknowability about him. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. But would you go on top of the pops? The more outrageous stories, like having the armoured car, which people always called a tank. Is the thing fire? Yeah, got about four rounds left. I need to buy some more ammo for it. I mean, what would you buy next? Uh, some ring. The mythology that grew up around him was a distancing device. At the moment, I've worked really, really hard, like with promotion and press and stuff. And I don't know if I've got it in me to like do it again. It's probably the last time I'll try so hard to promote myself. Well, the story is I'd been seeing a Cornish girl and she'd known Richard from Cornwall. She says, oh, you should meet my friend. He makes that music you like. 
Aphex Twin's logo is one of the most instantly recognisable pieces of graphic design of the early 90s. This is balanced out by the fact that very few people can actually agree on what it is. A saw? A boomerang? Part of the Albanian alphabet? There seems to be multiple versions of what it might mean. None of them are true. <laughs> Up until a few days ago, I would have sworn blind it was supposed to represent Richard hard at work over record decks. Until I met the man who designed it, that is. But it was just a letter A. An abstracted letter A. Paul Nicholson met Richard at Kingston University in West London. They shared a flat in Hackney and Paul went on to be his official dancer with a stint that included his first live performance in the legendary Trezor Club in Berlin. I was that type that... As soon as I walked through the door, I was on the dance floor and I would be there until the lights went up. And at the time, Richard's music wasn't accessible from a dancing point of view. His live sets were about 180 BPM. You were dancing on the B, not on the half B. You were, you were dancing like a maniac. Pretty much, yeah. So a lot of the time when Richard played, the dance floor would kind of stop and people would just look. Tell me a bit about your tenure as Aphex Twins dancer. It was just shy of about 45 gigs. It ended on a high note because there was a tour called NASA. It was Aphex Twin, Orbital and Moby. I think it was 13 dates through the States. I think there was a really bizarre gig we did in a shopping mall in Indianapolis. Then I who booked that. How did Richard's music go down to the no doubt fine shoppers of Indianapolis? Not only was it daytime, they'd put chairs out. <laughs> and they were just literally jaw open. What the hell was going on? <laughs> Nobody was dancing, just sat down in the shopping mall. Now, because you were dancing from on stage, was there an element in which you weren't just there to kind of entertain people, but maybe to take some of the attention off of Richard? He didn't want himself to be the focal point, some bod behind a load of kit. So I think he wanted something that would elevate what he was doing. He has a reputation for disliking interviews. Do you know why that is? I don't think he likes the whole process of trying to justify what he does in a way. I think the way Richard's managed his self-image is fantastic. It has people just absolutely obsessed. If dance music in the 1990s started off as purely anonymous, then the decade ended with his face seemingly plastered everywhere. He must have been the only person in the world during these years to simultaneously be offered the cover of avant-garde music magazine The Wire, Style Bible The Face and popular weekly The NME, while being pursued for remix work by Madonna and David Bowie. His rise from a Cornish bedroom bore to national anti-hero was completed in 1999, with the release of Window Licker a track initially overshadowed by its outrageous Chris Cunningham-directed gangster rap parody video. Aphex Twin arrived on our screens, the passenger in a 38-window stretch limo, which included a grotesque cast of dancers, all with his face. His entire appeal was dual, though. He was a magnet as much to music fans who loved to obsess over the banks of technical kit he was using as those who simply wanted to get lost in the beautiful alien melodies he was creating. The sense of humour on display here was defiantly unmetropolitan. It was sarcastic, unreliable, impish and heavily surreal. Even as he danced off our screens with a smirk at the end of the decade, having created one of its defining statements, we were left all wondering, is this guy for real? That's smart, that's clever, that's interesting, that's provocative. The musician Tom Middleton met Richard James when he was a teenager in Cornwall. We bonded on an intellectual level. The jump off point was humour, and we'd watch hours of the Reeves and Mortimer show. <laughs>
that appealed to him, it appealed to me. Reeves and Mortimer, abstract humour is the starting point for where he went. You've got to have some mystery. Years and years ago, I was talking to Joe Strummer and he said, I found the new punk rock, it's the future of music. Well, he said it was called Jungle. I'd been listening to Aphex Twin and I said, well, have a listen to this. He said, that's better. <laughs> Comedian Vic Reeves. With music nowadays, there is no mystery because everyone, it seems, wants to be very popular very quickly. It's like that artistic mystery which he had is, I think, really important. I was a huge fan of Eno in the 70s. I think when Eno started to wane, he took over. You know, you have to create a character to hide behind. I know I have. <laughs> Aphex Twin remains to this day, in terms of consistency, my favourite DJ. And in my head, it mirrors that old Cecil B. DeMille quote about making a film. Begin with an earthquake and work up to a climax. The first time I ever saw him DJing, the set was approaching the climax. And I made eye contact with some bloke dancing near me. And we were both laughing because of how crazy it was getting. But then, right in front of us, Richard D. James walked past, laughing his head off. I could tell the other bloke was really freaked out, and to be honest, I was freaked out as well. Like, if that was really him, he was actually on stage behind the decks. And to this day, I can't work out if it actually was him or not, or if Aphex Twin makes a point of hiring lookalikes to patrol the audience while he's DJing in order to freak ravers out. But the best thing about this story to me is that I'm still sat here two decades later or whatever trying to work out if this actually happened or not. But inspiring this kind of madness when he DJs or plays live is Aphex Twin's bread and butter. Just ask Robin Rambo, an electronic musician who performs under the name of Scanner. I went to this event called Disobey at a place called The Garage in London in Highbury in Islington. If you went because you knew what you were going to hear was going to be quite extraordinary and you never quite knew what to expect. I was nervous about getting caught recording at gigs so I carved out the middle of a big history book and I put my cassette recorder in the middle of it. Amongst those was this horrendous recording of Aphex Twin playing Sandpaper and Blender. He had a kitchen blender set up and as you immediately heard, he wasn't playing records, he was using sandpaper. People were just laughing because it was the kind of absurd thing you would hope that someone like him would do and get away with. In 1995, the Icelandic musician Björk picked Aphex Twin to support her on the American leg of her world tour. Her fans weren't always that keen on her choice of warm-up act as this anonymous review reveals. We were battered by an incessant cacophony of screaming, swearing, white noise, machine gun fire and what sounded like the inmates of a deranged monkey house. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty brilliant to me. So then on the second tour, which is where I met Richard, he's being offered 300 interviews and he's doing three only a day. That took bravery at that point. While on tour, Richard met Layla Arab, a musician working in Bjork's band. The two became friends and she would go on to release music on Aphex Twin's record label. He's very clear about what's for sale. For all the cleverness stuff, there is someone that really works at this. I mean, I, literally, his parents should get awards. The minute he's getting too good on one setup, he'll modify it because he knows then the methodology is dictating your composition. Was that record called Mixes for Cash? If you listen to his compilation album, 26 Mixes for Cash, which gathers together the best of his remix work from the 90s, you can hear that his method often involved completely re recording the song as if it was him who'd made the track in the first place. Technically interesting. And sonically interesting. That Bowie remix... I mean, it's phenomenal. 
as an act of bravery by him, but also by David Bowie to have led it out. He's bright and he's witty, but then you know that from the way he's operated his career. This is an important thing to remember. We wouldn't be sat here today discussing these odd stories about composing music while asleep and submarine ownership if his music wasn't so singular. He was smart enough to realise that people would be initially intrigued by these bizarre myths, but would then hang around for the breathtaking musical invention. A very early collaborator of his from the late 1980s, Tom Middleton, told us how Richard was an incredibly sophisticated, technologically advanced musician while still a teenager living in Cornwall. I open the doors to his bedroom and the first thing I see is two giant speakers suspended from the ceiling. Now, an 18, 19 year old already aware of acoustics. And the second thing that sort of flipped the switch, this setup that he had, he'd taken the lid off the 101, opened it up, he changed the maximum and minimum range of the frequency potentiometer. I remember just sort of sitting there mesmerised, watching the frequency running it down to sort of 100 hertz and then below. And you... Speaker cones pulsing. You couldn't even hear it, but the cones were pulsing. We definitely upset the dogs. I go by Vegan, I'm a producer. I work quite closely with Frank Ocean. Frank and I have been in the studio together and we were listening to a lot of music. We picked up I Care Because You Do and we were listening through it and when we got to Alberto Balsam, we probably just, he was like, can you play that again? The main thing that you can look at for his successes is, is just that most of his songs are totally instrumental. Some of them have his own voice in it, but there's no like lyrics. There's certain songs that resonate with different people. For me personally, I love all the melodic stuff. I think that's the most interesting iteration of him. Funnily enough, I was talking to a friend about this the other day on like Flim. I can't think of any other song where the drum fills are the hooks. Every time one of them comes in, I'm always singing along to it. His approach to melody is just something else. It's just that weird, atonal, but beautiful gray area where it shouldn't work, but it still does. In place of interviews, what Richard D. James has given his fans is a mythology and a strong visual presence. I love Aphex. I love Aphex Swing. I love you, Richard. So I only have one tattoo, that's an Aphex Twin tattoo. His logo is one of the strongest marks ever. Also because I have it tattooed on my arm. I think he's the most important electronic music producer of our time. <laughs> For me, I have like a mark in my heart with his atmospheres. As I listen to his music almost every day. In 2001, he released a highly experimental album called Drugs, which got the lowest possible star rating in Rolling Stone magazine. It was hated by some fans so much that the urban myth sprang up that Richard James himself had purposefully released a turkey of an album to get out of his record contract. Then suddenly, Aphex Twin disappeared from view, and it seemed as if his madcap career of innovation, mayhem and mischief had come to an end. There was talk he had retired, that he'd moved to the country, and that releasing music had become a chore. He wasn't so sure that the public even cared about him anymore. Then in 2014, as a lime green blimp was raised over London displaying the Aphex Twin logo, an Irish boy received an email from Richard's record label, Warp. It's Ryan Wire, Aphex Twin fan. I'm Aidan, Ryan's father. I'm Marie, his mum. 
Warp had tried to contact Ryan. Remember you thought you were going to be in trouble? You no. To speak to him. We're working on something, he said. Aphex Twin is planning to bring out a new EP and we'd love Ryan to do a video for one of the tracks. So that's what happened. He had discovered the joys of Aphex Twin's music online. Ryan, who is autistic and visually impaired, sat about making videos of himself and his friends dancing to the Aphex Twins' music in the street. We won't know when he's recording, so he records everything. As well as recording his own music from objects he found around the home. That was his daily thing, that's what he'd done. He'd mentioned Aphex Twin, we didn't know who Aphex Twin was. He's an Irish DJ, born in Limerick. It was the 23rd of November, 1968. The first album selected Ambient Works 85 to 92 came out on my birthday, 1994. We have come to expect bizarre marketing exercises from Aphex Twin, but this was his first official music video in 17 years. To hand the reins over to a 12-year-old was brave, unexpected and brilliant. Just really proud of him and he's really unique. When I get older, I want to be a director and a musician. Secretly, he likes pop music, do you? No. I think you do. I don't. Well, do you like you too? Yeah, I like you too, but I don't like Bono. <laughs> of course, the period of absence wasn't a complete drought. He released a clutch of records under different guises. If I was going to fax him right now, I'd probably say something along these lines. While a lot of time has been spent talking about how groundbreaking your music has been over the years, perhaps less thought has been devoted to discussing how you're also a conduit to the pre-Christian culture of the Cornish past. And that's not just through the song names you've chosen, but also because you were a product of the Cornish myth-making tradition yourself, part of a proud heritage that includes mermaids, giants, piskies and pobblevian. James, you droller. Richard D. James is a droll teller. Poe Guiador myth. A Cornish myth weaver for the 21st century. Ragan Kenza Kansvraden Warnigan's face. So go on then, give us an interview. <laughs>